Uh, I'm Joel Simon. Thank you, Pam. It's great to be here. Uh, as uh, Pam mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and we defend the rights of journalists all over the world. But and I'm enormously proud of that work and what we do, but I'm not really going to talk much about CPJ because I think the most useful thing I can do is answer this question, or do the best I can in 10 minutes. And I've just got a few slides that'll help uh, guide us along the way. So here's my first question, and when I put this up here, who cares? I'm not trying to be snide or sarcastic. I actually mean this literally, like who, who cares about the difference between uh, journalists and activists? Well, journalists care. They, they care a lot, and they like to argue about this, and they care, I think, because the distinction between journalists and activists is central to their uh, professional identity. But here's the problem. What distinguishes journalists from activists varies tremendously depending on an individual's perspective. Some journalists make a distinction between um, objectivity and, subject and subjective reporting. They believe that journalists must be objective observers and they shouldn't be linked to a particular cause or invested in a particular outcome. Some journalists rather focus on a commitment to accuracy, fairness, or, or balance. Others believe that journalists operate within a particular eth uh, ethical framework. They see themselves as the eyes and ears of the public. And others focus on where the information comes from. Is there a relationship with an established media outlet, or at least a blog? Uh, publishing something on Facebook or Twitter, the argument goes, doesn't make you a journalist. Well, media organizations obviously care a lot as well because they have to hire journalists, so they need to know what a journalist is. And for them, I think it's often linked to a certain kind of professional training in the craft or a familiarity with the technical requirements uh, of the profession. And of course, some media organizations ground their identity in a commitment to what might be called seeking the truth, no matter where it leads. Um, and they distinguish themselves from activists who may be gathering facts and disseminating them to the public but are doing so in order to achieve a particular outcome. And there are other media organizations, as we know, that want people with uh, opinions and agendas and believe this framework is, an, is obsolete. Um, other media organizations, their sort of institutional culture emphasizes a commitment to the process and a commitment to accuracy, but of course, there are many tabloids that bend the truth and the people who work for these organizations still call themselves journalists. Academics, well, they care because they study journalism in the media, and if you can't uh, define something, it's very hard to study it. But we've heard from Pam that, you know, uh, they, 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 you also have to see this issue from a historical and global perspective and understand how, how standards and perceptions evolve. And take, for example, the notion of impartiality. Uh, as a defining journalistic principle, as we've just heard from Pam, this is relatively new, and it was a concept that was really developed um, to maximize the market share. You know, why alienate part of your audience by expressing a particular political view. Uh, we know that for most of its history, journalism was largely partisan. And we have to recognize this is a very American concept. In much of the world, the press takes sides. And people express their political identity through the news that they consume. Now, press freedom groups, uh, they care. And I know this because I run a press freedom group. And, and, and so I care a lot. And uh, our mission at the Committee to Protect Journalists is obviously to defend journalists from around the world. And we embrace this mission even as we struggle sometimes to define precisely who falls within our mandate. Now, we don't have some sort of rigid definition of what constitutes journalism. If you're gathering news and information and disseminating it to the public or you're engaging in fact-based commentary, you may well be a journalist, at least within our book. We don't look at this issue in the abstract. Really, the question we're asking is, whether a particular individual who's been jailed or beaten or attacked, whether that individual is a journalist. And we look at this contextually. Is this person working in a society where the media is restricted? Is there an intent to inform? Is there an intent to verify accuracy? None of these questions are determinative, 
but they're all part of our evaluation. And that's why in certain instances we judge Chinese dissident bloggers to be journalists or activists documenting human rights violations in Mexico or groups of citizens in Syria uploading YouTube videos of the fighting. Okay, lawyers and judges care, but they don't care as much as you might think. And let me explain. In the United States, there is a debate about whether the press, free, uh, the press clause of the First Amendment confers any special rights on journalists. Most legal scholars believe it does not. Journalists are afforded special protections through shield laws, which are on the books in many states, and these allow journalists in certain circumstances to resist subpoenas and decline to reveal their sources. And that's good, of course, but there's a trade-off. If you're going to shield journalists, then you have to have some sort of legal definition, and to me at least, that's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right to let legislatures and judges determine who is and who is not a journalist, especially in such a fluid environment. The implications of granting legislatures this power is even more troubling when you look at the issue from a global perspective. Do we really want the Russian government or the Turkish government deciding who and who is not a journalist? Now, journalists, for the most part, don't have any special rights under international law. Like all people, they have the right to seek and receive information regardless of frontiers. Likewise, journalists who cover wars, they have the exact same rights as all other civilians, meaning they cannot be targeted. But they're not in a protected class like medical personnel. Now, why is this? It's because of a debate held half a century ago that led to the revisions of the Geneva Conventions. Journalists themselves rejected making this distinction because in order to give special status to journalists, you'd have to, again, cede to the government some authority to make the determination about who is and who is not a journalist and thus eligible for this special protection. And that's a trade-off that journalists rejected. So, as I made clear, it's never been easy to make this determination, who is and who is not a journalist, and the process has always been subjective and contextual, and I'm not going to belabor this point to everyone here. That's obvious. Technology has made it much, much, much harder. So let's take the case of Julian Assange. Um, I can't recall a more fierce debate among journalists about who, whether somebody was or was not a part of their profession. Now, my opinion, for what it's worth, is that he's not a journalist. I see him clearly on the advocacy side of the continuum. But here's the thing. I mean, that debate is interesting, but it's really a sideshow because if Assange were ever prosecuted for publishing leaked documents online, then all journalists would be at risk. And this is because what journalists do as we've heard, saw in our last panel, gathering information, making it available to the public, that's legally indistinguishable from what WikiLeaks does. So, in other words, drawing a clear, bright line between journalism and activism may be tactically self-defeating. Okay, so here's why it matters. The question of who is a journalist and an activist matters to most of us here because we fall into the categories uh, that I just outlined in my slides. And it matters in terms of how we understand our own role and how we, as a society, uh, access and understand information. These issues are very complex, and I really look forward uh, to talking about them uh, with my other panelists. But in many ways, it really doesn't matter because journalists, for the most part, do not have any special protections. And this is by design because journalists don't want to surrender, certainly not to governments or some licensing entity, the right to define who we are and what we do. So journalists operate in a broader legal and political framework that protects freedom of expression, and they must share this space and defend it alongside activists, but also poets, playwrights, novelists, political parties, bloggers, average citizens. Making distinctions between journalists and activists is interesting, and it's certainly a valid exercise at a conference like this one. But at the end of the day, journalists are freer, safer, and more secure when the line that separates journalists from activists is just a little bit blurry. Thank you. <laughs>